watchers in the fourth dimension. All calls for sacrifice. Any chance of any more toast, my dear? Captain Hart, Horatio Nelson was a personal friend of mine. Why, Doctor! Miss Grant! What a very pleasant surprise. Hello and welcome back to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension. I'm Anthony. I'm Don. I'm Julie. And I'm Riley. And old John's going to be pretty tied up with all these ships sinking. Is it fair to ask him to play golf in the middle of something like this? And this episode, we're heading out to sea as we encounter the Silurian's aquatic cousins in the Sea Devils. But before we tackle that, Julie's going to take a quick look at the mail. All right. We got some general feedback. Um, one from Mike Muncher saying, watching the curse of fatal death again and the exact language the doctor uses, gravel queries and I'll explain later, are oddly similar to your tally titles. Any relationship there? <laughs> um, no. Nope. <laughs> Legally distinct. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh-huh. Thank you, Don. <laughs> and then any chance curse is on the bonus episode list for the future? No, it's a main episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way off. We will be doing something with it around the time that we do the TV movie. And my current thinking is we will do a regular episode featuring both that and Dimensions in Time. But as I said, long way off. We got some time. See you in 2035. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to some feedback for the demons. Mike Muncher again has said, great episode. My daughter and I laughed heartily several times. I really appreciate that. I'm glad that we can make you laugh. And the demons was I think a favorite of a lot of us. Oh, yeah. Our friend Adam Wright, a few things here. I love a little occult mixed in with my who. That's just like Anthony. Please talk to him more if you ever want to talk about cults. Or the occult, sorry. Both, really. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Everyone observes how Joe is treated, but I've seen the doctor being asked quite a few times, especially in Hartnell's era. And I think our main concern is that he's so smug and condescending where Hartnell really wasn't that condescending. He was mean, but not in such that smug way. Also, cantankerous old men are just inherently funny, and you don't <laughs> take them seriously. <laughs> so that's why we like him a lot. Not to say we don't like the third Doctor, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. And then he also said, I compared Azal to looking like Mr. Tumnus from the BBC production of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. <laughs> and I love that. I think that's great. And then some feedback from Dave Columbus. When you discussed the coven and whether it had been there already, the first thing that popped in my head was from Hot Fuzz and the Neighborhood Watch Alliance. <laughs> yes. The friendly group with the smiling faces that kill anyone who got in their way of winning Village of the Year was the Master's Coven made up of all the local business owners looking to improve their village standing. <laughs> I love that. I'll take that as headcanon. Absolutely. Edgar Wright, you plagiarist. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. From our season eight retrospective from J.M. Casey. It's really interesting hearing this talk about Pertwee and his likability as the doctor or lack thereof. Pertwee wasn't my first doctor, but he was my first favorite. It actually turned out that his first third doctor story was The Sea Devils. How fitting. Over the next year or two, considered him my favorite and even dressed up as the third doctor when I was 10. And I think that is adorable. Awesome. And one of the things they said is it never occurred to me at that age that he could often be an utter dick to his friends. <laughs> Sometimes we oversee things. And again, I think we don't hate the seasons. We just think that he's a jerk. <laughs> so he can still be your favorite. You can have whoever your favorite is. Dave Columbus again. Pertwee is not on my list of top five doctors, but season eight does make it into my list of top five seasons. It's well-rounded with a nice variety of stories, along with some of the best guest characters. Yes, mostly Bill Filer and Miss Hawthorne. And I can totally understand that. It is a very solid season. There's no really low points and the demons is really good. So I get it. I am disappointed that Dave didn't include my boy, Mr. Chin, in his <laughs> list of best supporting characters. Not everyone will agree with you, Anthony. I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> no one will agree with me. <laughs> and then we have the Whovian gal. I totally feel you guys on struggling to accept Pertwee. As a massive Troughton fan, it took me a long time to accept him as the Doctor, and then I didn't really start to like him until Season 9. Hanging in there until Season 10, that's when I really think he starts to shine. And again, I want to like him. We all want to like him. And I think we're all seeing hints of how we could like him. So we're almost there. And then one last one for the Doll of Death from Nathan Laws. The whole idea of time moving forward, interacting with time moving backwards, is the entire basis of the movie Tenet. Spoilers. As I have not <laughs> seen Tenet. 
Me neither, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. I did see it and I didn't understand it, so it was like I didn't see it. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I recommend as a very fascinating concept that really works. Mark Platt claims in the extra he plotted out the story with the forwards and backwards timeline on top of each other so that he could keep everything straight as to what happens when. All right, spoilery, but I do think it sounds interesting and there were some, a few struggles here and there. I think all of us really kind of enjoyed the Big Finish story, and they did a fairly decent job of doing that with the plot line. Yeah. And that is it for the mail. Thank you, Julie. And as a reminder to our listeners, we love hearing your feedback, thoughts, comments, and questions, and we do try to read them out on the show, as you've just heard. So please do get in touch. You can contact us through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at, at watches 4 d or you can email us at watches 4 d at gmail.com. Anyway, diving behind the scenes on the Sea Devils. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> the concept for this story goes back to when producer Barry Letts and script editor Terence Dix were first planning season nine, and they decided that they wanted an adventure that would take place on or around the sea, a setting that the show hadn't really taken advantage of previously. To write the story, they turned to one of the era's regular writers, Malcolm Hulk, and the three of them decided that Hulk would write a sequel to season seven's Doctor Who and the Silurians. However, this time, he would introduce aquatic versions of the creatures, and the serial was commissioned with the working title of The Sea Silurians. It was also decided that the serial would see the return of Roger Delgado as the master, picking up his storyline following his arrest at the end of his last appearance in Season 8's finale, The Demons. Letts and Dix believed that the master had been overused in Season 8, you don't say, and decided to use him more sparingly in following seasons, leaving audiences questioning whether or not he might show up in any given serial. The Sea Silurians was scheduled to be third in the running order of Season 9. This would normally have meant that filming would have occurred during the winter. However, wary of the possibility of filming in a maritime environment in a harsh winter did not appeal to the production team, who were still a little scarred from the filming of The Claws of Axos the previous year, where Katie Manning, as a reminder, nearly suffered from frostbite and had to wear makeup that hid her frozen complexion. The decision was made to shoot the season out of order for the first time ever, and The Sea Silurians was to be filmed second. By mid-July, Hulk made the decision to rename the serial to The Sea Devils. He also added in lines to attempt to correct the scientific inaccuracy of any creatures originating from Earth's Silurian Epoch. Unfortunately, the Eocene Epoch wasn't really any more suitable, occurring well in advance of humankind's ancestors. Assigned as director for the serial, we have the return of Michael Bryant, who we previously saw directing Colony in Space, and he had also held other behind-the-scenes roles in several serials in both the Hartnell and Troughton eras. Joining him as designer, we have the first appearance of Tony Snowden, who would contribute to the show twice more, once in season 15 and once more in season 22. And as costumer, we have the only contribution to the show of Maggie Fletcher, and her only other TV or film credits are for Paul Temple and the Palaces, so no idea what she did for the rest of her career. I looked, I couldn't find anything, so hope she made money somehow. Anyway. When it came to filming the serial, Letts was able to secure the assistance of Britain's senior service, the Royal Navy. Using the prior assistance and positive experiences of the British Army on the invasion and the Royal Air Force on the mind of evil to persuade the Ministry of Defence on the matter. They were keen for the Navy to take part and provided men, equipment and facilities to the production with the caveat that the Navy was portrayed in a positive light. Hulk had written much of the serial's first two episodes to take place on an oil rig. When Bryant was unable to secure such a facility for filming, he worked with Hulk to hastily reimagine those scenes taking place on a sea fort. Another change that Bryant had to make was once he realised that the Sea Devils were effectively naked, he had Maggie Fletcher hastily design them some clothes in the form of blue netting. The shoot itself turned out to be a very expensive one. Lots of boats to be hired, even if they did have the help of the Navy, lots of cameras to set up in hazardous environments, etc. So, to save costs elsewhere, Bryant elected not to use regular composer Dudley Simpson, turning instead to the BBC's in-house radiophonic workshop. John Baker was the member of the team originally assigned to the serial, but fell ill, and the young and relatively inexperienced Malcolm Hulk was... Uh, Ma Malcolm Clark, sorry, not <laughs> Malcolm Hulk. Too many Malcolms was assigned in his stead. Clark provided a highly experimental electronic score for the serial. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm experimenting with how to turn this damn thing off. Help! <laughs> Is it this button? <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's stuck on the fart patch. Help me! 
The completed serial was broadcast between the 26th of February and the 1st of April 1972. Like The Curse of Peladon before it, the first two episodes were heavily impacted by power outages that resulted from the ongoing miners' strike, which was resolved during the broadcast of this serial, and if anyone was wondering, they got a 20% pay increase. But ratings were, once again, heavily impacted. One amusing little anecdote about this serial is that on the 13th of March, after the broadcast of episode 3, the BBC was visited by two officials from the Ministry of Defence who were concerned that the episode showed footage of a top-secret prototype submarine. It transpired that the footage was a model that had been bought from Woolworths <laughs> and modified by visual effects designer Peter Day to give it a more advanced look, including features such as streamlined propellers. In his modifications, he had inadvertently created a close approximation <laughs> of the Polaris submarine design being tested at the time by naval intelligence. That's pretty impressive. So with that, we swim into our short summary, Sorry, oh, which is in the hands of Don this episode. Don, over to you. Oh, boy. All right. All right. So here's the Sea Devils. It's the Silurians, but this time with the Master, sponsored by the Royal Navy. And this is key, not shit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that it? That's it. <laughs> It covers the same moral lesson as the Silurians, hits most of the same beats in different ways. It's just better. Although they missed a trick by not calling it the Silurians. <laughs> <laughs> All the puns. My first note is very important. One of the first people that we see is our telegraphman Bowman. And my first reaction to him was, that looks like a brunette Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> I found that very important. Because I feel like that sets the tone of what happens throughout this entire serial. Thank you. I think Dawn's absolutely right because this is almost like they looked back at Doctor Who and the Silurians and said, you know what? Things have changed. We know what we did well back then, what we didn't do well. Let's just redo it. And this time with the lessons we've learned. And Dawn is right. It didn't prove it. Yeah, it did. Let's start with episode one. And we start with boats and the Navy and wonky camera angles. Oh, yeah. Dutch angles yes. all over the place. <laughs> and as I said before, a really farty synth patch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's what it sounds like. No, he you're not wrong. That. What I'm thinking of is they say that he was younger, Malcolm Clark. And I'm like, did you give this to a five-year-old? <laughs> How young? <laughs> How young? Because like before I really knew it was a young guy who's doing it, I was like, we've talked about cats before, but really I think we gave it to a toddler. <laughs> and then I found out that he was young and I was like, okay, yes, we gave it to a toddler. Uh, I do have a question on that. And let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. When we did the season seven roundup, we rated Doctor Who and the Silurians almost across the board as being the worst use of music in the season. And Riley, I think it was you who said that you found the use of beeps, boops, and kazoos to be incredibly annoying. Was this better, worse, or about the same as the soundtrack to Doctor Who and the Silurians? This was not as annoying, but it wasn't done well. Except for in, I believe it was episode five, when they started using the soundtrack as a weapon <laughs> against okay. the Sea Devils. <laughs> yes. But no, like, I think it was less annoying than the Silurians, but I think that it was just poorly done in general. I'm simple. I agree. It's less annoying. Therefore, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I praise from Riley. <laughs> <laughs> Back on track with the actual episode discussion. We get location shooting. Lots of location shooting. And I loved it. I was like, we're on the water. And you can very clearly tell that they're on the water which I love, and all of the different beaches and oh, wonderful things, wonderful things. And then Joe's outfit is on point. It is white and purple, and it's beautiful. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think <gasps> that her look is the best look she's had, plus the hairstyle that she's had ever on the show so far. That mm. wardrobe, that hairstyle, perfect. Looks great. She looks great if she's going into an office or maybe even to like groovy 1970s club. But adventuring with the Doctor, yes, it looks great. Not exactly the most practical option. She didn't know she was going adventuring. Yeah, yeah she didn't True. know. It's better than a short mini skirt in which she's just going to flash everyone all the time. 
Especially with all the little like places that she's climbing into. It would have been really bad this episode yeah. if she was wearing a short skirt. Yeah. That's a very 70s action woman outfit. The only problem is it is white and that is going to stain. So she yeah, I was going to say, the dry that. cleaning bills. Come on. Anthony, you don't understand. It's not about the dry cleaning. It's about what you look like, how you present yourself. Okay. And she was beautiful. Yes, she was. I agree. She looked great. I just, again, questioned the color of the suit more than anything. Wrenching this away from Anthony's being wrong... Can we talk about the master and how they remembered he had the hypnotism and they did it in such a wonderful way by saying, oh, no, all of our guards are hypnosis proof. <laughs> but they kind yeah. of flip your expectations and then you even find out that the worst warden in the world isn't hypnotized. He's just stupid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was I thought you were going to talk about the master's prison workout. That was pretty good, too. I know. I was like, I was waiting for like a master's prison workout video. That would have been awesome. In this first episode, I was very sad because we had always talked about how wonderfully put together the master always is. And then I saw him in his row machine outfit. And I was like, we're really we're going to see the master in sweats. Like, I, <laughs> this is not what I was on board for. But we do get that in the future. But I have a question about these guards. Why in the world do these guards have these weird cape looking things? I feel like it's not really normal dress for like 70s military or private security. It's called fashion, darling. Look it up. <laughs> wow. <sighs> no case. In case no you case. just tuned in, you're listening to the Doctor Who fashion podcast. <laughs> we discuss Joe's outfit as well as the prison guard outfits. And the master's sartorial elegance in this too. All of their true. outfits look like, okay, deep cut. Biggs from the original Star Wars, his outfit in the cutscene, oh. only in blue. Oh. Deep cut. But yeah. right. Deep cut. I think I'll only have one or two more costume comments, and they're not for right now. So No, no, it's fine. This was the first and only costuming credit for the costumer, correct? Correct, yes. on the show. And then she only had two other credits to her name on any shows. Then it is significant. And it's pretty solid, honestly. Like, it's one of those things where, yeah, I can complain about the master being in sweats, but guess what? He was working out on a row machine. He should be in sweats. So I think for the most part, she did pretty well. I just have comments about the Sea Devils outfits, but that's, we'll get there. There are a couple of things I want to focus on here. Yes. I want to come back to the master, but I have two other comments first. Doorless cars. What the hell? <laughs> yes. What? <laughs> Tony Snowden, were you on acid when you designed this? I think it's easier to film doorless cars because then you don't have to do these interior shots within the car. You can actually just tape from outside and you don't have to do any crazy angles. They lose more guards that way. <laughs> just give them Land Rovers or Jeeps like Unit have. Much mm. easier. <laughs> the other thing I noticed, the first two episodes of this looked really rough. There were parts where lines weren't defined well. I mean, the film stock seems to have degraded quite severely despite the efforts to restore it. I found that quite distracting at times. You're too nitpicky, but all right. Yeah, I know. It exists. And that's not the fault of the story. It, yeah, yeah, it exists. I want to talk about when the Doctor and Joe go in to see the Master. He seems genuinely happy to see them, and Pertwee can't help but give it a little smile, and they laugh and joke together, and it's just, it's very sweet. The Doctor clearly misses his frenemy, and the Master acts like it's the same way. Even Joe seems happy to see him. It's kind of unusual from her perspective, but she, I mean, she's just being pleasant. It's one of those things where... I kind of get it, but also at the same time, I'm like, they are frenemies, but like, I don't know. I do notice that the master either wants to impress the doctor or he wants to watch the doctor be amazing. It's like one way <laughs> or the other. He's like, I just, one of us needs to be shining and at our best and I'm okay with whichever way it goes. Hashtag Time Lord Excellence. <laughs> But that whole thing is very, very quickly shattered because as soon as the Doctor and Joe leave, the Master lets out that wonderfully evil cackle. So he's playing them here. But you know what I want to talk about? Chairs? Chairs. <laughs> Still remember the chairs. <laughs> I appreciate that, guys. <laughs> Deep cut. No, I want to talk about this show that the Master is watching. The Clangers. <laughs> What is that show? It's an actual show, and it's in there because they were running 90 seconds short, and it's the best. <laughs> what is this show called? The Clangers? 
The Clangers, yeah. So it was like a little British stop motion show about these little creatures who live on the moon. Because they look like little aardvarks or anteaters or something like that. I don't know what was happening. I love that he thought it was real and then was really disappointed and just went and turned it off. Did he think it was real? Because he kind of gave Trenchard this little kind of grin and you're kind of thinking, does he actually think it's real or is he just screwing with Trenchard? I got the feeling he did because he pretty much walked over and turned it off in this kind of sad way. In my head canon, he thought it was a real thing because in his life, aliens, he sees them all the time. So why not? I think that scene is iconic because RTD basically steals it and does it again with the master watching the Teletubbies. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I think that's a very deliberate homage to this. All right. No more beating around the bush. Let's talk about what I think is all on our mind, on the tip of our tongue, but we haven't said it yet. I'm going to say it. In this episode, the doctor has a delightful scene where he pays off the guy at the pier and he does the whole like <laughs> Crimean War, blah, blah, blah. Okay. When that happened, did anyone else feel like this feels different? Yeah. yeah. Something has shifted. Yep. The ground beneath us has moved and now it feels like the third doctor is suddenly moving on to being this charismatic and most importantly, calm cool, relaxed character, not some guy that's constantly trying to one-up everyone and put everybody down. Yeah, it's yeah. the clear, yeah. like, twinkle in his eye in scenes like that that really sells it. He's got a little bit of charm, but also a little bit of cheek to him as well. I still think eating Joe's sandwich was kind of a dick move, but it was played <laughs> for comedy, so I'm willing to forgive that one. And it was the only one. Yes. Yeah. I agree. We're finally getting these moments of things going like that. I love it. Although he does another name drop with Horatio Nelson. I'm like, come mm -hmm. on. You're not impressing anybody. <laughs> You're really not. That's the other thing is like, can you just please stop with the name drops? That's also almost a dick move as well. Well, yes, except Admiral Nelson had been dead for quite a long time by this point. So Captain Hart's yes. just sitting there like, that what the hell? This guy's insane. That's the point. If you tell someone you know that, like, uh, oh, they've been dead forever, he doesn't think you're a time traveler. He just thinks you're a lunatic now and he's going to ignore everything else you say. <laughs> Which yes. even Captain Hart says, saying that he's as mad as a hatter. Yeah. Yeah. We also get introduced to the guys on the sea fort, right? That's the name for it? Yes. And I was pleasantly surprised that one of the guys survived and not both of them dead. So that was nice. And then we finally see the sea devil and I was like, what is it wearing? <laughs> and honestly. I'm just sitting here. I'm like, it should have stayed naked. Netting was so in that year. <laughs> and once again, I'm sorry if you don't know fashion. But see, that's the funny thing. When I look at them and I really try to study the look of the creature, especially with the netting, all I can see is a sea turtle stuck in a fishing net. That's yeah. all I can think of. Fishing net bathrobe. <laughs> See, I thought, like, when I first saw it, I was like, that looks like a little house on the prairie dress, because <laughs> the way that the lighting was, and then I realized that it was netting, and I was like, well, at least that makes more sense for the setting, but my first reaction was, they just put a creature in a little girl's dress. This is weird. <laughs> so, that that was my... You can tell pretty easily that Michael Bryant was like, shit, they're naked. Maggie, get them some clothes in less than an hour. Like, well, I, I so, got some netting. And they just had a penis in a cave the previous episode. <laughs> <laughs> What's their problem? Anyway, I think we're just about done here. I think so. The Doctor and Joe make it onto the sea fort. They find one of the two guys dead. And as she wants to leave, the Doctor says they need to find the radio. And we see a sea devil or what seems to be a sea devil coming towards them in the corridor. And that leads us into our cliffhanger. Yeah. And their boat got blown up. And episode two. You're going to try and summarize, at least leave in the important bits. <laughs> Sorry. One comment that I have, and it's for the entire serial, I hate how all of the cliffhangers were done. Yeah, they weren't very strong. I don't even necessarily think it was because of the content, because I feel like having the, a boat blow up and then having a creature come at you, that can be a really good cliffhanger. But it was just shot so oddly, and it was just like either split seconds or I don't know. There was just some... Something about it just did not feel right for almost any of the cliffhangers. And they're still doing the recap issue, where it's <sighs> like their recapping w is way, way too long. 
I can kind of side with them on that because it's not like anyone's going to be able to rewatch the previous episode. Right. So I think they're trying to give some context. And on top of that, don't forget the first two episodes were very heavily impacted by those power outages yeah. to the point where prior to actually playing the episode, the on-air narrator gave a summary of the previous episode as well for episode two. Yeah, I just made a comment. And just because we're talking about the recaps right now, the intro and recap took two minutes and eight seconds in episode three. Wow. wow. Yeah, it was a lot. What's interesting here for episode two, we are left with the impression it's a sea devil coming towards them in the corridor. And then once we get the resolution, it turns out it's the other worker from the sea fort who's not dead. He's just in total shock. Yeah, it's budget 1970s Nick Frost. Yeah. (laughs) One question here. So obviously the Sea Devils have destroyed the radios because they're not stupid. And the doctor claims that he can use a transistor radio to make a transmitter. Does anyone know if the science behind that is actually real? Maybe. I could probably Google it, but I don't care that much. I did like the (laughs) fact that once again, we get a a good doctor character moment where he's nearly, you know, hurting his arm, patting himself on the back, and then it blows up. And that's funny. That's a yes. good moment right there. That was really well played. What I like here also is we get some vulnerability from the Doctor. So when he meets the Sea Devil, he initially tries to befriend it, tells it he has no wish to harm it, and the feeling is very clearly not mutual, and the Doctor takes off down the corridor, panically slams the door shut and barricades it, and he looks terrified. Yeah, no karate chopping there. <laughs> that comes later. <laughs> yes. For a small period of time, the weird gun thing that they had when i first saw it i thought it was like their actual hand Mm. (laughs) i thought they had one real hand and one that was this weird machine thing that shot heat i don't know and then i figured out oh that no that was just a gun yeah Mm. oops it's better than the third eye that the silurians had that's Uh, agreed agreed i also want to talk about the sea devil when the doctor electrifies the door and you hear it scream that scream for me was really unnerving. That was really good sound design. It was. I really liked the sound design of them across all the serials. I thought that the screams that they had and everything was really good. Their voice got a bit annoying, but apart from that, mm-hmm. I think it was yeah. really well done. I actually think their voices weren't any more annoying than the Ice Wars. I think they're a little less, not so hissy, hissy. Just slightly hissy. It's just that slow, labored, asthmatic. Oh, yeah. It is like, a bit okay, slow. come on, get on with it. <laughs> so, Don, I know you already touched on Pertwee massively patting himself on the back, but the first time he wires up the gadget, it doesn't work. Right. And Joe kind of makes a little jibe and just talking about the shift in his personality rather than yelling at her, he laughs along with her. Yeah. Yes. Very He's fun. Cool. He's cool now. Yeah. It's like he has an inner confidence. He doesn't have to like be on edge all the time to like, you know, like he's worried about looking bad. He just has a confidence in himself. That's, you know, like Fonzie. (laughs) (laughs) He's always going to be cool and calm. You're not cool if you're on edge all the time and always worry that people are going to think you're not the smartest person in the room. I mean, you realize that if they would have allowed it, Pertry would have had a scene where he did, a you know, the uh, the skis and jumped over a sea devil. (laughs) That would have happened. (laughs) Jump the sea devil. I really do feel that between seasons eight and nine, the production team took a look back and said, we need to make some tweaks to the Doctor's character here, and then followed through this season. Yeah, it seems pretty obvious. Yeah, Yeah. and it seems successful. Yes. Yes. Yes, very welcome. Let's get to the Master finally getting his snazzy outfit, and he's wearing the captain's hat. Yes. Yeah, doesn't he look dashing in a Navy uniform? A boat hat just improves everything, in my opinion. (laughs) Although one would think this would be a good time to use his mask-making abilities, and yet he doesn't. Well, he's assuming no one on the naval base knows what he looks like. Still, he's a pretty high-profile prisoner, an idiot in charge of guarding him, so, you know. And that's the interesting thing, because Trenchard and Hart are clearly friends. They play golf together, all that kind of stuff. (laughs) But they apparently don't talk about work because Hart has no idea who Trenchard is gardening, apparently, despite being 10 miles away on the same peninsula. He didn't have the right security clearance. I can just about buy that, actually. Yeah. Can I talk about how creepy Trenchard was to Joe and how gross that was? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because I like cringed every time he touched her. I was like, nope. 
nope, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I can't. What I loved, though, is I can't remember if it was this episode or the next episode. He went to shake her hand and she did not touch him. And I was like, yes. <laughs> She's oh. like, nope. No. I have a note here that says, Jesus Christ, Trenchard still <laughs> blithering on about this damn golf game. Also, he's a bit creepy to Joe. He was very creepy. He was pretty obviously being a distraction. Yep. But I don't know about the rest of you, but I was trying to figure out at this point in the serial, has he been hypnotized? Or no. you know, does he genuinely believe or is he working towards some, you know, evil thing along with the master? No, he's an idiot. <laughs> I kind of like that. I like that he was just an idiot. It's kind of said subtly, kind of blink and you miss it kind of thing. But basically, the master has appealed to his patriotism and told him he can help him catch some enemy spies. Yeah, but that came out later. Yeah. And yeah. And it's just like, you know, they'll be so happy for you and you'll get rewarded. And he's like, I'm just doing my patriotic duty. And it's like, OK, whatever, fine. But <laughs> he's still not smart. And it's not like he has like some grand purpose or grand scheme that he's doing. He's just like, I'm doing the right thing because I'm an idiot. It's the danger of the well-intentioned idiot. Yes. But here's the thing. You are told that you have one of the biggest security risk prisoners in the in the world under your auspices and under your watch. You're told he can hypnotize people, told he's a master of manipulation, and yet you let him manipulate you. Because he's an <laughs> idiot. We've established mm -hmm. this. Yeah, he is totally incompetent and should never have been given this position. You're correct. But guess what? I know plenty of people in authority who are idiots and should not have that <laughs> level of authority. He also lets swords just hang out on the walls of his prison right outside the prisoner's chambers. Yes. Yeah. Which leads us into our episode two cliffhanger. Big sword fight. I love it. <laughs> It was wonderful. I love the little kind of Looney Tunes around the corner kind of bit <laughs> that the doctor does. Oh, it was so brilliant. I love him like leaning against the wall, just watching him. Oh, love it. And this is where I think, sorry to hit on it again, but I feel like this serial is the turning point. I'm putting my cards on the table here. This serial is to me, unless it completely reverts next serial, but this feels like a complete turnaround. As we said, he's cool and calm, but also he's just funny. You know, he's acting like Bugs Bunny instead of Daffy Duck. <clears throat> and I, I think that might understand what I mean by that. <laughs> mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And there's a moment in the middle of the fight where the doctor just stops to take a bite of sandwich. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's a lot of food eating in this cereal. <laughs> there is, and we'll get to Walker later. Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, boy. No, I don't want to. We end with the knife throw. Yep. And we get into episode three, which I already mentioned, had that two minute and eight second recap. <laughs> yeah. Before we finally find out what happens. And it's not all that exciting. It never is. The resolution <laughs> is never exciting. It's so disappointing. I'm like, can I just leave it at the cliffhanger? And then like the next thing that happens is like, oh, we're at a new serial. It's like, well, what happened? Well, <laughs> let your imagination tell you what happened, because it's probably better that way. <laughs> We get the doctor getting arrested by Trenchard, who tears up his unit pass, claiming it's a forgery. But before he got in the fight with the master, the doctor sent Joe to go and call unit and give a report. And she gets stopped because Trenchard tells him to. But she is an absolute badass here, overpowers them, escapes, and then goes and does some running around and, you know, opening doors and letting the doctor out again on her own. And we've already talked about the Doctor's shift. I feel like the characterization of Joe has shifted. Here, she's super competent. She Absolutely. is. Although, if the Doctor had been a bit more competent and not told Trenchard she was leaving and just said, oh, she went to the bathroom, he could have saved her a lot of trouble and she could have gotten right to the base. Yes. Just saying, don't tell people your plans. <laughs> but Joe is so active in this serial. She's constantly sneaking away, coming in, trying to rescue the doctor, going around, getting away from people, being effective, being yes. successful. It mm -hmm. happens so much. She's like a spy or like a thief character from D&D. &D. She's always sneaking around, always hiding, always like getting behind people's backs. It's wonderful. And she gets in, I believe, yes, episode three, a really good karate chop. She gets to karate chop. <laughs> so as much as I'm going on and on about the doctor's change, and Anthony is right, 
They write Joe great, this serial. Absolutely great. She oh, yeah. almost seems like a new character. I mean, as much as I love Joe, and, and don't get me wrong, but it just is like, it's such a turnaround from what they've had before. And I'm just like, I understand that they're trying to like do new things and make Joe a little bit more competent and things like that. But it just seems like, man, this this one serial turned it all around. Well, they gave her stuff to do. As a character, she had motivation and things to do. They didn't have to make her smarter. She didn't have to be a scientist. She just had to have something, a goal to achieve. That's all it took. And that was the case in the last serial as well with the Curse of Peladon. Mm -hmm. I feel like they've suddenly realized that they underused her and maybe having a smaller cast in the majority of serials this season. So if you think about it, almost every story in season eight had a main cast of six characters. Here you're down to two or three in most stories with a couple of exceptions. So there's more time to focus on Joe and give her stuff to do because you're not trying to also find things for Yates to do and Benton to do and the Brigadier to do. Well, Yates should never have anything to do because Yates is useless. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing, like, on Facebook, Nathan Laws keeps commenting to tell us that we're expecting too much of Joe. You know, she's meant to be a ditzy and stupid character, like... And I don't I disagree. necessarily agree. He also mentions on several occasions they give her a character arc. I don't think there's been a character arc. She's suddenly gone from not having things to do to having plenty to do and being super competent at it. There's no development there. It's suddenly like, oh, yeah, we should do stuff yeah. with Joe. It's not about making her smarter. It's about utilizing her as a character. It's not a character flaw. It's a writing flaw. And it's one of those things, too, where I think people misunderstand when we say we wanted her to be more competent or, you know, we needed her to do more things. We don't need her to be sciencey smart like Liz Shaw was. We don't need her to be like some of these other smarter characters. We just need her to do the things that she would need to do. She was brought in as a character who had this background of doing all of this unit training and all of these different things. So just let her do those things that she was trained to do. Right. There's a lot more to a character that can make them interesting, appealing, active than just being intelligent. There's so many other things. I don't want to bring it up, but I'm going to bring it up. That was Jamie in a nutshell. Jamie was not mm. the smartest character. He was from the past. He didn't have all the smarts, but man, he always took action. And, you know, in certain situations, he was actually very intelligent, just not from a book's perspective. He would no. take action whether you wanted him to or not. <laughs> no, Jamie, no! But how many times should they have listened to him? And it was more often than not. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the Navy personnel, because we met Hart in episode one, but we didn't really talk about him. We also have Third Officer Blythe, who is the only woman in the serial aside from Joe, which is a shame. And she is the only one outside of the Doctor and Joe who question whether or not Trenchard is telling the truth to everyone else. So she's a really smart cookie. Yes. And we also meet the submarine commander. I think his name was Ridgeway, who is played by the legendary Donald Sumter. Why do I know that person? He was in Game of Thrones and he is in okay. New Doctor Who as Rassilon in Series 9's final episode with Capaldi. Oh. Ah. I want to comment on the fact that a lot of these naval officers had really awesome beards, and <laughs> yes. I want to applaud them for that. It was better than some of those guards that had the weird, creepy mustaches. Oh, yeah. They were the rise of the mustache brigade. <laughs> Every single one of them. So British military facial hair etiquette is the only service where you're allowed a beard is the Navy, unless you're an intelligence officer undercover in one of the other services. Hey. Hmm. So lots of beards this episode, and I approve as a bearded man. <laughs> Yes, that was wonderful. I liked all the naval characters. I liked that they all had purposes. They weren't just thrown in for no good reason. I liked Blythe. I wish she had had a little bit more to do, but she was so smart. And every time that she was on screen, there was a purpose to her. And I was like, you know what? I like her. So I was good with everything. I like we haven't gotten to my least favorite character, but we will get there. <laughs> Let's talk about Joe rescuing the doctor. Because, again, this is her being super competent. It was wonderful. Everything about it. You had her sign language message, which I, I think may have been referenced in a much later Doctor Who episode. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. I believe yeah. you do. I loved that whole sequence. I loved that he understood it and was just like had this grin on his face. And I was like, man, like, when did they grow this rapport of being able to just understand each other so well? 
I don't want to say it's out of character, but it's just a completely different move than what we've had before. It only happened once before it was Mind of Evil in the chess scene. That was the last time. Yeah. And Riley, as you say, when she actually gets in there and they get the guard in to trick him, Joe is the one who gets to karate chop him to the throat. Yeah. It's magnificent. It's not the first time she's used physical force. She also did it in Mind of Evil as well. I don't know if you recall, she gets the gun off the prisoner. Which kind of leads us towards our cliffhanger because they escape, they start running and end up on the beach where they're kind of cornered by the guards and the master with his gadget summons the sea devil and they end up running into the minefield, which is our cliffhanger and brings us into episode four. Where I like to point out, I wonder if anyone else noticed this, but as the doctor and Joe are going into the minefield and he is laying himself down on the barbed wire so she can cross, after they do that a second time and he's coming up from being on the ground, he takes out his sonic and then pretty sure for a good like eight seconds, you can see the boom mic in the lower left hand (laughs) corner of the frame. (laughs) Which I guess it, you know, I bet, you know, on a beach getting good sound is probably tough because usually there's a lot of wind and the waves are loud. But yeah, that wasn't the best there. He also landed on the sonic screwdriver when he did the roll and actually hurt himself with it. (laughs) Yeah, he hurts his ribs. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, it's so funny. I guess I must be like clueless to these things because I totally missed the uh, boomstick. I had no idea. I missed that too. Okay, I'm not the only one then. This was basically the first time we had a good look at Sea Devil, and I thought they look pretty silly. You know when you're watching Japanese science fiction and you get like a (laughs) kind of comical bug-eyed man in a suit, in a rubber suit? That's what they look like to me. I love them. Yes, I think they're ridiculous, but I love it. There is something charming about them, despite them not looking threatening at all. They're just very goofy. They kind of have like a, it's their large bug eyes that kind of are very Muppet-esque, like Beaker or something from the Muppets. I agree. It's really endearing, but equally, I wouldn't have been surprised if they had stolen the costume from Super Sentai, if Super Sentai had started (laughs) at this point in time. I think it would come across better if they could blink. It's just those big, huge eyes that never move, and it gives you that, okay, it's a guy in a suit. But I like the fact that they tried to make them taller by putting the head on top, and there's like a little thing where the person can see through. So it's not a bad design. It's just limited by when it was made. And I also don't think that the outfits helped. Again, my (laughs) thoughts were they should have been naked because I actually think they would have been more threatening. Also, their variations, you have to give it to them. They added slight variations in their Mm -hmm. color. And it could have been so easy for them to just, you know, go cheap and just up, 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 up and make it the same costume over and over again. And some of them were drastically different sizes. Like there was a short sea devil. I specifically (laughs) remember the short one. I was like, oh, look at him. (laughs) So cute. The other thing I wanted to talk about here quickly is the sonic screwdriver. Don, you mentioned it, that part we fell on it, but... I think this is the first time we see it used for something other than traditional screwdrivery things, because the Doctor uses it as a mind detector, and it can detonate the minds as well. I think they're at the point where they're like, you know, this can get us out of a lot of writing issues right here. (laughs) (laughs) Lippery slope right there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Absolutely, but I love it. I like that they start doing more with the Sonic. You know me, I want to see more with the Sonic. I want to talk about the Master's always plotting against humans and he never learns from his mistakes he always makes these giant massive big plans and they always fail but the problem is is that it's almost always that he relies on some other group of individuals whether they're humans whether they're silorians or it's some other creature alien what have you i'm like master you keep on relying on the wrong people (laughs) (laughs) choose more wisely but that's just my comment is that you know it continues on and on and on that he makes these big grand schemes with people that he shouldn't trust oh actually no my other favorite is why was there a random person on a horse (laughs) oh with the guards that were running after them yes they're being chased by guards and one of the guards is on a horse why We can afford cars and a horse, and we bought a helicopter for this story, and we're spending money here. Well, we couldn't afford a car with doors, though. No, no, those doors, man, they will set you back. 
luxury additional option on cars these days. If only they'd had a horse with doors, then it would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, those are my big comments. So the Mustache Brigade gets wiped out when the Sea Devils attack. I would like to say I was sad, but that would be a lie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also in this episode where we really, really dive into that credit at the end where we thank the Royal Navy because it's at this point where we have the use of so much footage that I felt like I was watching an educational video <laughs> about being in the Navy. In the Navy. <laughs> I knew it. I knew someone would. It's like, you know, like on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, well, you know, mostly the show was shot on set. They would always say like, hey, you want to know how bread is made? And then they, you know, have this like, you know, <laughs> tape roll of like a factory or something that makes bread. Well, that's what it felt like with this episode where it's, hmm, the Navy needs to go do something. And this is how the Navy does stuff. Here we go. <laughs> Roll that video. And the doctor going down in the diving bell is totally Pertwee's type of thing. That's very oh, yes. like man oh, action. Yeah. And Pertwee, as we mentioned when he joined the show, was in the Navy and he seems to really relish being in that setting again. Absolutely. One thing I want to comment before we actually get to that whole dive sequence is time when... Frenchard, he finally dies. <laughs> but what I was interested in was the fact that when he first gets the gun out of his desk, it was either going to be he has never fired a gun in his life or some real bad shit went down at some point in his life and he doesn't want to pick it up again, but he's going to have to. And it turns out it was the second thing because he was actually really good with a gun. And I'm like, oh, man, was he in like what World War Two at that timeline? I guess I'm really bad with ages. He might have even served in World War One. OK, based wow. on his age. Yeah. So it was one of those situations where I'm like, I bet he's remembering from when he's had to shoot this before. And it was probably in some war. Actually, we're in the 70s, probably World War Two. Yeah. I actually thought the way his death was shot was really well done because you see him kind of making a stand, but you don't see him die. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. when the Sea Devils walk into the master's room, after they've all filed in, you just see Trenchard dead in the corridor. Yeah, I really liked that whole sequence. That was an interesting way of doing it and really conveyed the brutality of it. He wasn't a nice guy, but I don't think he quite deserved to die at the hands of the Sea Devils. He wasn't evil. He was just stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sleazy yes. yes and it's the doctor who drives home the point the master had no further use for him that's just harsh should we talk about the dive scene i mean the dive scene went about exactly how i thought it would i figured that the doctor would go in this thing would go down there and when it came back up i was like guess what the doctor's not gonna be inside bum, bum, bum. they kind of milk that for time too oh absolutely so i guess that takes us to episode five it does. And I love how, even though Hart clearly tells her that the doctor's disappeared, she has to go and check for herself. Like Captain Hart's just playing a prank on her. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor's actually here. How funny. <laughs> that would have been some strange pacing. If only that would have resolved the cliffhanger. If that resolved the cliffhanger, that would have been amazing. <laughs> In the middle of all so this, bad. and he just pulls a dick. We're like, nah, he's fine. He's right there. I'm just messing with you. It's cool. But, guys, my least favorite character is introduced why in the world did we have to introduce the suit penultimate episode like really you should have either brought him in earlier so i could have hated him more or just not brought him in at all because like just two episode arc oh he manages it to be wonderfully hateful in two episodes though oh, oh definitely and from his introductory scene oh. ordering food and breakfast like that's not my job here oh hey you know he's trying to be chin but there's only one chin when it comes to, like, eating on the job. Well, one, he used an outrageous amount of sugar in his tea. Like, dear God. <laughs> I like a little bit of honey or something like that. But, man, you don't have to put four tablespoons of sugar in a small cup of tea. Holy crap. Also, awkward close-up of man eating toast. Like, ugh, mastication. <laughs> I don't need to see it like that. Oh, disgusting. And he's so demanding of Blythe, like she is meant to be his personal secretary or general dog's body or right. server or what have you. And what's nice is that you can see that she's doing what is asked, but you can tell that she's just like, ugh, this guy. We've had some shitty bureaucrats before, but he seems to be the worst yet. Yes. Yeah. But it's very intentional because they made that whole thing about, OK, well, you have to be nice and show the Navy in a good light. But then they've got this government guy. <laughs> I mean, if they'd brought in arrows going, look what an asshole he is on screen. They couldn't have pointed out any more clearly. 
Yeah, the way he will kind of very nonchalantly talk about lives being lost or ordering nuclear strikes and then be like, so where's that toast then? Mm -hmm. Immediately after that. He's Dr. Strangelove. (laughs) I love how they can be, hey, be really kind with the Navy, but you can make shitty government characters all day long. I mean, they probably didn't tell them they could do that. They probably just (laughs) did it. (laughs) Well, we need to get back to the Doctor and the Sea Devils because now we get the full explanation and laying clear of that this is Doctor Who and the Silurians redone. Yes, it's the same thing. They want their planet back. (laughs) They want it back. And all I could think of when I watched that scene where it was made absolutely clear what the Sea Devils wanted, I just imagine how great it would have been if there was a smash cut and suddenly like it's a darkened room and then boom. A body jumps out of bed, and it's the brigadier. And he goes, <laughs> my nation needs me. <laughs> There's something I have to do. And he comes running into the story. But that didn't happen, unfortunately. It did not. <laughs> it's one of those situations where I didn't like Unit at first, and then all of a sudden I'm like, I'm missing some of these Unit characters. Can we bring at least one of them in? Yeah. Yeah. Going back to finding out what's going on, it is Doctor Who and the Silurians again, but we also have the Master whose sole intent is really to ensure that the Sea Devils destroy humanity just to upset the Doctor fundamentally. (laughs) He's like, you love these humans so much, I'm going to make sure they're all destroyed. It's so ridiculous. I just sit here, I'm like, Master, I get having like an arch nemesis and things, but like you're going to kill off an entire human race just because of one man? What? Yeah. To be fair, he was bored. I mean, they <laughs> locked him in a room for a while. <laughs> locked me in a room so I'm going to destroy your planet. A little bit of an overreaction. I do really love the ending of the scene where we're under where we're under the belief that the doctor has talked some sense into the sea devils and there's that touching kind of like slow high five. You mean the palm sex? That becomes their thing. <laughs> for like this I episode, that. that's their thing. It's palm sex. We know this, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, guys. I don't think you are sorry. No, I don't think so. I know. <laughs> you're sitting there thinking, how can I work the title Doctor Who and the Sea Man into this? I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my. Oh my. <laughs> what I love about this particular episode is the timing of it all. Just as the Doctor's getting through to them, that's when Walker orders the strike and destroys everything the Doctor's built. Yep. It is... So perfectly timed, and it's like, ah, oh, really, guys? Really? You're gonna pull this shit? <laughs> yep, sounds about right. He really does remind me of Chin, but without any of the comic incompetence. I don't know. I found him to be a pretty comical character because I knew exactly what was gonna happen. He became more comical in episode six. He did. When he lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it was wonderful. One thing I did notice, sorry, and it was uh, after that whole airstrike and the Silurians get upset again, or sea devils, whichever you want to call them, humans are back to being apes. Yep, I actually have it in my note that that would upset you. (laughs) (laughs) But they only used it once, and I'm actually more okay with that. I'm like, okay, we did the thing, we said the thing, but we're not going to sit here and reiterate it every, you know, five minutes. So applaud. They learned their lesson. One thing we've completely glossed over in our discussion is the little subplot with the Submariners, which kind of becomes important as we Mm -hmm. move towards the Doctor getting out of the Sea Devil base because they've captured the submarine and they're all there conveniently so that the Doctor can get out on the sub. What I do love and thought was hilarious, but obviously understanding it's within the capabilities of the time in terms of special effects, was when they were trying to escape in the submarine and the Silurians put up a force field which was made of tinsel. It's festive. I mean, we are recording this. It's December 8th, so we are pretty close to Christmas. I just thought that was really charming, honestly. What else are you going to use? Yeah, as I said, no criticism. I just thought it was really endearing. Let's wrap this episode up and move into the final episode. So they escape... Walker eats some lunch, or talks about (laughs) eating lunch, I'm not sure which. And we have the big attack instigated by the master of the Sea Devils on the naval base. And Walker wants to nuke the Sea Devils, because of course he does. 
gets talked out of it, but then as Joe, the Doctor, and Hart are walking through the base, they're basically held up by a sea devil, and that leads us into our cliffhanger and onto episode six. And that's where we get a Pertwee Gurn. <laughs> we do. So that is a plus one to the gun count. We also had, and I'll explain later in episode two. Oh, we did? Yes. I noted it, and then I forgot to mention it. What happened there, Don? Oh, my God. I don't quite remember, but it did happen. <laughs> I think it was talking to the guy in charge of the naval base where he said, there's no time to explain now. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we'll take that as an implied. I'll explain later. I like how we go into our next round of what always happens between the master and the doctor is that the doctor is pretending to work with the master and sabotaging it. But the master is watching him with like this expression of, I just admire all the work that you're doing. And <laughs> he's a little bit in love with the doctor. I know we keep going back into it, but it just seems a lot more clear in this one. This was the master's plan all along to have the doctor <laughs> be his lab partner. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting to the part that is the most unbelievable of this entire serial. Joe climbs into an old ventilation shaft. And her white outfit is pristine when she gets out. <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It should be covered with dust, cobwebs, dirt, and it should be real gross. And nope, it is pristine. Maybe she picked up the fabric on Peladon or something and it's resistant to all that in order to avoid the horrific dry cleaning bills. That seems too easy. Yeah, I'm trying to headcanon this, guys. <laughs> you mean you think that was a gift from Peladon? Maybe that was his party <laughs> gift since she said no to the marriage. Have some fabric. <laughs> Have a pantsuit. <laughs> We are getting to the point where the doctor figures out how to use the episode's own score against <laughs> the sea devils. <laughs> when he turns on the machine, in addition to laying in parts of the score, they use the same sound effect that the emotion machine from the invasion made as well, which I thought was pretty neat. I like the reuse of that. I wish it had just been the reuse of that as opposed to adding the noise. I'm not calling it a soundtrack. I'm calling it noise. On top of it. I love how afterwards the doctor's like, oh, I must have had the frequency too high. Sorry about that. Oh, wait, no, I actually had the input jack in the output socket. Oops, my, my bad. bad. It took way <laughs> too long for the master to like shut it off. Yeah. Like you're going to really sit there for like five minutes and wait for this thing to be over and then take him at his word and be like, oh, you just mix those two up. OK, it's going to work now. I wasn't entirely sure if it was audible to humans. I think that may be why. I'm not sure. Huh. That might make sense. Head cannon accepted, done. Yeah, to humans or time lords or non-fish people. We also find out that after he fixes that, we find out that the master had told the sea devils that he wanted the doctor killed. Yeah. Yeah, like he would do. And the doctor looked very upset about that. He was just like, my lab partner wants to kill me. This is so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Is this what Time Lord flirting looks like? Basically, <laughs> yes. So we get the wonderful hovercraft. Oh, yeah, yes. that was cool. Yeah. And it's also a circus hovercraft because, dear God, how many people were in that hovercraft? <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations, Joe. She did a great job. She got the reinforcements that were needed and things like that. And man, I wish jet skis had been a thing. <laughs> Those things were not quite jet skis. No. So we almost no. had a jet ski chase. Yeah. Apparently, Pertwee chose those vehicles. Originally, they were going to be speedboats. And he was like, I've seen this thing that I want to use instead. He does that a lot, doesn't he? He does. <laughs> Three wheelers, jet skis. We needed to discuss how the Doctor warns the Sea Devils about how difficult it would be to defeat human beings. And they kind of learn their lesson because they get utterly decimated in this episode. Yeah. Like they're getting yes. like mowed down for every like one human being you see go down. There's like five sea devils that go down. I mean, I just have to imagine the entire beach was like littered with dead sea devils. How do you deal with that? They have to come around with some drawn butter and some cocktail sauce or something <laughs> afterwards. There's a Gorton's fish stick plant just up the road. <laughs> it's fine. They probably do taste delicious. <laughs> battered sea devil <laughs> so we have our jet ski chase and the doctor catches up with the master and they get caught they're imprisoned blah 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 come on and then we work together and then we have our big boom so to speak because the sea devils 
didn't realize that the doctor had that his famous line first yes, declared exactly. in neutron and also yeah. put a booby trap on the off switch. <laughs> yeah. I thought just rigging the device to do the opposite of what it was meant to do was kind of a cheap move happening off screen, but I did love the booby trap on the off switch. And and very important because sometimes it's very important for the show to always maintain a consistency with the character. The Doctor, remember, was upset with the Brigadier about blowing up all the Silurians. The Doctor only did this because he specifically asked him, like, are you certain this is the path you're going to take? There's no way I can change your mind. He, like, double checks this before he does this. So he's not a hypocrite, you know, and you know he doesn't want to blow them up. But it just is very clear that they are not going to change their mind. And that's very important to the character. And I think that's where the master really makes a difference. Because he has, to an extent, manipulated the events of the story to a point where there can be no peace between them. And the Doctor has to make that decision in this story. He either sides with humanity or he sides with the Sea Devils. And of course he's going to side with his friends. Right. I just really do appreciate that he does give them one last chance. Oh, absolutely. And he does it without threatening them. He just asks them, like, are you sure there's no other way? It's a good character touch. It's a very important part of the character. I completely agree with that. So as soon as they're done, Walker gets some more food. <laughs> he orders his tea and we get the master escaping because that's what he does. Yeah, with his Jean Parmesan disguise. <laughs> you know, he had to do it. Well, not just that, but he pulls a Pierce Hawthorne. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking maybe a Hannibal Lecter move, really, when you think about it. I was thinking the going down, clutching his chest, pretending to have a heart oh. attack. <laughs> <laughs> but man, he steals a hovercraft. I'm kind of jealous. And no one bothers to chase him. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> we're tired. Let him go. It's all right. Uh... We know he'll be back sooner or later. <laughs> So let's go ahead and rate this. Riley, we will start with you. I really enjoyed this one. It feels like the show has taken what it did well from season seven and season eight, put it together and removed all the bad stuff. They basically, as we talked about before, redid the Silurian episode with improvements. This time, they gave the companion a lot more to do. It is six episodes instead of seven episodes. They add in the master. In my opinion, the costumes are an improvement, at least the creature costumes and the music is arguably an improvement <laughs> but most importantly the doctor is cool calm and charming now the criticisms are that at times i feel like i was watching a military training film the plot <laughs> is very basic especially since the story has been told before and the old authority figure is a terrible asshole trope is being a bit worn out but with exception to my man chin who is my personal mvb most valuable bureaucrat I give this <laughs> eight and a half Doctor Who endless trip specials out of 10. Wow. Mm. All right, Don, we will go with you next. All right. I hope I've given everyone the impression that I liked this story because I really did. It really did take all the good ideas that I liked from the Silurians and it removed all the bad stuff. I really like the way that they're writing the third Doctor. I really like the way that Pertwee is portraying the new writing of the third Doctor and I like the fact that they actually gave Joe something to do besides just stand around. That's really awesome. So I'm going to give this 8.5 buckets of Mr. Chin's chicken for our friend, Mr. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, would you like to go next or would you like to go last? I'll go next. It's fine. There's not that much more to say. A lot of reasons why it's better. Taking an old idea, making it better. Joe had so much more to do. The doctor wasn't a dick, which was wonderful. We had some excellent navy beards, so I enjoyed <laughs> seeing that. And the master, when do we not love to see the master? The biggest downside is the fact that it was a repeat, so not really necessarily a new idea. And the music was garbage, just not as much garbage as the one prior. Uh, <laughs> so I will also give it eight and a half brunette Chuck Norris's out of ten. <laughs> Okay, and that leaves just me. And I agree with a lot of the points that my good friends on the show have made here. I think it's well executed. It's well written. 
The characters are well fleshed out. The characters that you are not meant to like are unlikable. For me, the replay of the Silurians works because you have an agent of chaos in the master in there to really remove that moral ambiguity and make the final decision a little less hard to come by. My minor criticisms are the score, just like everyone else. And candidly, my other one would be Michael Bryant's over-reliance on weird camera angles. Mm -hmm. It's not quite yeah. as cool and clever as he thinks it is. That's fair. But otherwise, I'm more or less on the same page. So I actually think I'm exactly in line with you guys. I'm going to give this 8.5 impractical cream suits out of 10, <laughs> which gives us a story average of, surprise, surprise, 8.5, since we all gave it the same score. <laughs> With that, we are at the end of the episode. We will be back next time to discuss The Mutants. For now, as always, thank you very much for listening and have a good one. You have been listening to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension with Don Smith, Riley Shrek, Julie Philippek, and myself, Anthony Williams. This episode, Rise of the Moustache Brigade, was recorded on Wednesday the 8th of December 2021. If this is your first time listening into the show, all of our previous episodes are available wherever you like to get your podcasts. You can interact with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at watchers 4 d and you can also email us at watchers 4 d at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and consider leaving us a review or rating on your favorite podcasting app. All of those things really do help the show. And always remember, we had absolutely no idea that the Sea Devils were coming back when we recorded this. But for the record, we're quite happy about this news.